church where we serve a still speaking God. If you are kissed by the sun or challenged by it, you are welcome here. If you're gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, or questioning, you are welcome here. Here we celebrate our differences, PhD, GED, no D's at all. Guess what? This is the church for you. Here we say I'm sorry, here we love each other, here we form loving community. We are so glad that you chose to be with us this morning. Let us worship. On this Labor Day Sunday, let us in a special way lift up all those people who labor, either for pay or as volunteers, in jobs or at school, at home or in the workplace in the United States and around the world. Let us read together our unison prayer of confession. We want to build a just world for all, but we confess that our actions do not always affirm and honor each other. We confess that on some occasions we have blindly bought goods made by people who are engaged to live or work in unsafe conditions. We admit that we have failed to end an unjust system some workers had jobs that provide good wages and benefits, while others may have a real job or one that pays little and provides few benefits. Creator God, help us to be your people, working for a world where all workers are valued, a world where those who clean houses are also able to buy houses. that is a huge step 
in diminishing these kinds of practices. It's called the Chicago Fair Work Week Ordinance, and it will require employers to give 10 days advance notice of what your schedule is going to be starting 10 days out, which is huge. Um, and with an hour's pay for any change that has to be made during that 10 days. It provides for at least 10 hours between shifts, and it provides for half pay for shifts or hours that are canceled at the last moment. It also um, provides for offering full-time employment to part-timers who want it before hiring extra part-timers or temporary workers, which of course makes people eligible for more money and benefits. I'm also happy to tell you that the organization that Pilgrim supports, Arise Chicago, probably, you've probably seen their director preach here in the past, um, was the spearhead of this campaign and um, was also the voice of faith communities in testimony at the city council and in visits to individual aldermen to gain their support. And I'm really happy to tell you that the board chair of Arise this year is the Reverend John Thomas, the former general minister and president of the United Church of Christ from 1999 to 2009. So we at Pilgrim have contributed both material support and also important leadership to this big step forward. So happy Labor Day. <laughs> I believe Jesus was one of those people who early on spoke truth to power. Um, the power within the Jewish world was often held by the Pharisees, the educated folks. And so um, they were real happy with him. They've been following him around. Our description today is from Luke 14, verse 1, and then verses 7 to 14. And we get, a, we get an example of him speaking to his power after several weeks, months of them following him around, harassing him, asking him questions. So I don't know how he got invited to this party, but here we go. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor, in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you can start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm sure there's some of you today that remember sure. growing up where you had actually dinner at a table, where you sat around the table. Remember that? Yes. And dinner couldn't be served until everyone was at the table and the phone hung on the wall. <laughs> and if it rang during dinner, you better ignore it. <laughs> Things have changed. It's so uncommon to sit down at a meal as a family that researchers are now studying the benefits of that practice, trying to beckon us back to that common table when we took time to look at each other and actually eat without a smartphone in your hand. 
And it's hard, I know, with all our schedules and soccer practice and business meetings and church meetings. So this scripture takes us back to a time when sitting around a table was of utmost importance. In the ancient world, a formal dinner was a way in which an elite family, the kind of family who could afford such a dinner, proclaimed and maintained their status in the community. Community, The guest list was very important for the invitation indicated that one was accepted as a member of the elite. Family members and important people of the community needed to be honored in this way as they would be accepted to reciprocate. <coughs> it might be a source of honor for someone to give charity to the poor, but it's quite another thing to invite them to a social function in place of family and people of wealth and actually eat with them. I mean, if you did this, you're kind of dishonoring your family and wealthy neighbors because poor people would be sitting in their place. Or in the eyes of the elite, the host could be dishonoring him or herself by so identifying with the poor. So in this cultural context, those who invite family and people of status are exalting themselves by having these functions. And those who would invite people not of that social class, the poor, the crippled, are humbling themselves. Now, the Jesus of Luke loves to eat and drink. The table is taken so seriously in this gospel that Jesus gets into trouble because of his eating companions. He's known as a friend of tax collectors and sinners because what he ate with them. Now, it may sound silly, but you need look no further than the symbolic acceptance of being cool or being a nerd around the school lunchroom to understand the weight of one's dining companions. And it doesn't end there. Just think about the drama of a wedding seating chart <laughs> or, or the status of the executive dining room, who you eat with and where you eat still today has great social implications. Because table fellowship infers a certain type of acceptance. So this week's lectionary reading from the Gospel of Luke describes such a scene. Jesus is invited for a Sabbath meal by a leader of the Pharisees. And arriving early, he sits and watch watches as his fellow guests scramble for places of honor around the table. And after observing this drama for a while, Jesus calls them out with a parable. Knowing full well the social rules of his day, he shuns them and calls instead for a revolution, a radical turning around. Not a revolution of arms and bloodshed, but a revolution of worthiness. The scripture says, when you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor. Go and sit at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he or she may say to you, friend, move up a little higher. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So, okay, the first half of this scripture seems to be common sense good advice. How much better to present yourself as humble and be invited higher than to risk being embarrassed. But the second half of this parable turns the focus of the etiquette conversation from guest to host that suggests the host should invite the outcasts rather than the popular ones. So Jesus turns to his host and continues, when you give a lunch and a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case so that they can invite you in return. And you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, 
the crippled, the lame, the blind, and then you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. So, okay, this is a little more progressive, but on the whole, I still feel like we should say, okay, be nice to other people, and then move on, except I think there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. I mean, etiquette, after all, is not simply just about manners. It's about honor. It's about shame and social position and political standing. And these things matter a lot. It mattered then and it matters now. I think, in fact, it's worse in some ways because your honor and shaming are most often public now due to social media. And that honor and shaming and inclusion is not just confined to intimate, close settings. So I think this scripture isn't just about etiquette, but rather Jesus is challenging the status quo. He's kind of inciting something of a social revolution. And we know all too sadly what happens to revolutionaries, people who have advocated turning around the status quo. Some scholars even say this is one of the reasons he's inviting the death sentence he eventually will get. I know it may sound a little dramatic, but I suspect that we humans are just insecure enough and that life is just crazy enough that the one thing we all crave is order. Who goes where? What fits where? We need to know where we stand. We need to know where we belong. We want to know how we're doing. We need indicators of how we're measuring up. And here's the thing, given how small we usually feel, and really, in comparison to the vast cosmos of the world, how small we really are. We seek that sense of order and status by comparing ourselves to other people. That's why social pecking orders are so important. Love them or hate them. We need to know where we stand and what groups we're a part of. And so here comes Jesus, telling the guy that's invited him to his home for dinner, how very rude, and who also happens to be a leader of the Pharisees, that this pecking order stuff, this social order that he's living into, he doesn't believe in it at all. And more than that, Jesus is inviting this guy, his host, and us to defy that social pecking order, actually turn it on its head. Now, of course, I think Jesus is pushing us today to consider who is missing from our tables, to examine who we've pulled the shades down on, to consider who we have written off, who we value less. Because Jesus knows that who you sit at the table with matters, both literally and figuratively. Because it shapes who you are and the assumptions that you make. You know, this, this Jesus that we profess to follow is a kind of in-your-face, ride-or-die-for-the-kingdom type of brother. His name it and claim it theology was to name the injustice, to name the self-destruction, to name the othering that we do to each other, not just in places of power and privilege, but the othering we do in our private, intimate spaces, where we eat with our friends. The othering we do in our private, intimate 
spaces that do not reflect the new world order he was proclaiming. Now it sounds good if you're on the outside to be invited to the banquet, especially if you're on the outside. You're the one that probably planted and harvested the food. You certainly cooked it. And your place at the banquet was to serve and to clean up, only to speak when spoken to. How great would it be if you were invited, but this sounds pretty threatening if you're already on the inside. I mean, will those outside, will they eat all the food? <laughs> will they dirty my linens? Will one of them flirt with my daughter? Will they get next to someone I've been trying to impress and take away my opportunity? Ugh, will they bring their friends? That's what happens when you invite outsiders to the table. It's a new humanity Jesus is establishing, a new humanity that has no place for our insecurities and craving for hierarchy. It's a new humanity that considers the worth of every single human being, which is why it is frightening <laughs> and why those invested in systems of inclusion and exclusion which is all of us. At the same time, made all of us complicit in his destruction. Because this, this alternative worldview may just cost us a little too much. Now, if he was saying we could all sit in the place of honor, I can wrap my head around that. Or if he's saying some of us are more blessed than others, I can go along with that. But to invite the very people I define myself against to be at the table with me, and they can't even return the favor, that's asking a lot. This Jesus guy, where did he come from? But here's the thing. This is the one we proclaim to follow. And here we are shown having the other at the table is not just a nice thing to do, it's the right thing to do. In fact, it makes for a better table. Having people around the table who don't look like us, act like us, talk like us, think like us, sing like us, dance like us, who are not us. Having those people at the table help us to understand the beauty of God, of the Almighty, of the sacred, just a little bit better. <clears throat> Difference and diversity undergirds an excellent and broad university education and even a beautiful church community in which distinct perspectives inform and illuminate each other. Sameness, even though we gravitate to it naturally, but sameness is not a sign of the kingdom. Nowhere does Jesus say that the goal is sameness. Being with people just like us, being with people who believe and do everything as we do. And Jesus doesn't even guilt us into meeting the needs of the poor, the crippled, and the lame. He just says, invite them. So this isn't about charity. This is about real community. If you would dare have them, you know, one of those people, as part of your community of friends here, Jesus saying, you'll be blessed simply because they cannot repay you. You'll be blessed because when they're around the table, the fear of the other will cease. 
You'll be blessed by the perspectives and insights you might not otherwise be exposed to. To eat and drink with God is to live in tension with the pecking orders that define our boardrooms, our college admissions committees, our church politics, our presidential elections, and that can be tiring. But guess what? Friends, that is exactly what we're called to do, to humble ourselves and place our hope in a radically different kingdom, a radically different way of viewing the world. I know that's asking a lot. For here, the demon that we face is ourselves. But we are assured if we take one step in faith, God will take two. And even when we fail, if we keep our minds on things eternal, we're sure the race is already won. So today when we open this table for communion, let us be conscious of who is not here. Who would never think that they would be welcome here? Who might be afraid to walk in these doors? And let us all work together to make room for them. Amen.